Perfect. <clears throat> All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Baylor, and I'm going to be talking about the Cargo Connect season uh, and kind of what's new, what's different, and what's the same for this year. And before we jump into that, a little bit about me. Um, I run the E3 Robotics Center up here in Elkhart, Indiana, and this is actually going to be my 22nd uh, season of first. I uh, originally started back in 1999 as a student on a first Lego league team. I uh, did three years of that, three years as a high school mentor uh, to younger teams. And now I help with a lot of uh, local teams with all the programs at all the levels of first um, here in kind of the local area for us. So today I'm going to talk about the game rule changes, uh, the robot game that you see behind me uh, a little bit, the Cargo Connect missions a little bit more in depth, uh, specifically a few of them that I think are going to be a great um, kind of starting point for a lot of teams this season. And then the, the innovation project model, the innovation project itself and how those two tie together a little bit of an overview of what has changed on the judging rubrics and apparently a giant chicken um, on the table as well. And so we'll get to all of that as we go through. So first I wanna jump into the game rules. Uh, I know this is probably the hardest part for uh, a lot of teams to get their students to kind of latch onto is the, the game rules themselves. Uh, the nice thing is they have created a full booklet of the game rules now. Um, normally they, they did not send that, you had to print that off in the past, but uh, now they have updated some of those to be a little bit more clear for students, uh, coaches and mentors to understand as you're kind of going through those various things. So uh, I wanted to highlight some of the ones that they particularly changed within the rule book this season. So for R1 and R2 that talks about the equipment and the software and control of the robots. So for R1, you'll see up here on uh, the, the screen showing the controllers, the motors, and the sensors. Like Lori went over in her uh, presentation just before this, talked about the Spike Prime, the EV3, both being viable options for teams to use this season. And they have the motors that go along with them, the large and kind of medium or small motors uh, for Spike Prime and EV3. And then each of them have their own types of sensors. Um, you are limited to one of the bricks of the brains. So one of the bricks from either Spike Prime or EV3 and four motors total. That means you can only bring four motors up to the table when you come. Uh, this means that you can't be switching out other attachments that have additional motors on them. So you have five or six at the table total, uh, just four motors total and your whole robot design, um, whether they are attached to the robot uh, on an attachment that you put onto the robot and plug in, only four. And then sensors, they don't limit the number of sensors that you can have only the types of sensors. So those are the ones outlined here and in the robot game rule book uh, under R1 there. And then for R2, uh, last year they opened this up as well to make sure that any software that allows the robot to move autonomously can be used. So like Lori was talking about in her previous presentation, there are a lot of uh, new updates to the program, the at-home apps, uh, both for like Chromebook, for downloading for iOS and Windows devices uh, as well. And all those are great resources. They are block-based coding, very similar to Scratch. They also have uh, a Python word-based code in there. And I've seen teams use Java. If you have access to the, any of the old programming stuff, you can certainly use that as well. Um, so if your students are more comfortable programming in various languages uh, to make the robot move, as long as the robot is moving autonomously, you're good. And then they just clarified R6 and R8 a little bit better for missions of how a mission is defined within the rulebook. And then for R8 is the technicians, two at the table at a time, 
you can switch them in and out kind of tag team style. So a lot of teams will have a kind of a couple students at the table that have worked on a various mission throughout the season. They're the ones that they send up to run the robot at the table. And then they switch out with the next group and two new students come up to the, the table and uh, set their robot up to run as well. So that's all acceptable when you're at a competition is to switch your, your students in and out so they can run their various uh, programs and missions throughout that. Then um, for equipment and inspection area up here, they have defined that a little bit more. Um, they have the small inspection area and the large inspection area. These are back again this year where everything that you have for your robot needs to fit in one of these two areas before you start. It has a volume, so it has a area and it has a height limit on it. So that height limit is 12 inches. Everything has to fit within that section, either in that marked small inspection or that larger inspection. You do get the mission bonus points if everything, your robot, your attachments, anything that you're using for your robot run, uh, not including the extra mission models, so you don't have to put those in there, um, but everything else must fit into that smaller inspection area if you want the uh, mission bonus points for that. Um, last The past two years, honestly, that's been some of the easiest points to get uh, for this year's game that and then after the mission inspection there is no longer a height ceiling um, so they have eliminated the height ceiling for launch which is wonderful um, and that's kind of a new change so you can set your robot up and it can be taller than 12 inches but just during inspection it has to be smaller than that for home and launch area, they've defined that a little bit clearer as well. Uh, that launch area is that quarter circle that you have in the corner of your map here. Everything must start within that area, that quarter circle for your robot to then be launched or go out of. So that includes the, the robot, any of the mission models that you might have for that, that your robot is transporting uh, have to be within that quarter circle. Any of your attachments, arms, anything like that, they can't be hanging over that line at all. Um, they do have to be pulled back behind that line before you start your robot. And then they have clarified home to make sure that it is pretty clear that your robot can return to this quarter circle or anywhere off of the map over here on this side. So it doesn't necessarily have to return here every time. It can come over and return to this whole section of the table that is not being used by the mat. And that allows your students to pick the robot up, adjust, make those changes like we've seen in the past. Um, so that has done uh, been clarified as well. And then the last one is the R16, which is just stopping the robot at the end of the match is okay. So as long as it's done with whatever it is, you can go ahead and stop the program that's running. If it's still running, you're not gonna get any points or penalties taken off for that this year. Uh, also take a look at the rules defining the precision tokens. Uh, those points have changed this year as well. And the wonderful thing is you can pick your robot up once and not lose points. So as soon as you start picking it up multiple times is when the points start coming down. So just because your robot you know, crashes, burns out, falls over, tips over, whatever, you still have the chance to pick that robot up and bring it back penalty free uh, for that first time before start getting kind of point deductions for that. Then the robot game itself for Cargo Connect, uh, we're seeing the same type of map that we saw last year and the year before. Uh, Lori made a great recommendation of if you have not seen a in-person run of a robot match before, I highly suggest going back and watching uh, last year or even uh, City Shaper the year bef before that to, to kind of get a little bit of an idea of what that looks like. It gives you a great idea of how robots start in the launch area, how robots are coming back into that, and how uh, robots move throughout the table itself. 
And then for the mat size, like I said, we're seeing the same type of mat size we saw the past two seasons, uh, very colorful mat, but we still have lots of lines. So if you are using line, uh, you know, your line following techniques, the nice thing is you do have that white area around that line to help follow that. The lines are a little bit different. They're not as jagged as we've seen in years past. They do have some more gentle curves to them. I think this will help some teams out with some line following uh, as they're trying to program and keep consistency as far as that robot following the line instead of having it jerk so much as it's trying to turn and readjust to some of those harsher lines. We still have that quarter circle in the corner there, and we have a what I like to call an end game location or mission where the robot is wanting to end the two and a half minutes of its match uh, to get some points. This year is different uh, from the past couple of years that we've seen. One, in the quarter circle, we have these little tick marks on the edges of that quarter circle itself. I think that's gonna help with alignment as teams are working on creating stuff to align their robots up. Uh, it adds to the grid system that's already within base, which is nice. And then also this year, we're seeing smaller models on the table. We're not seeing gigantic models that the robot has to interact with. No client or hanging bar like last year where the robot had to like hang on it or drive under it. Uh, no giant bridge like in City Shaper that connected the two that the robot has to drive up onto. A lot of the, the missions here are quite a lot smaller than what we've seen in years past. So it does mean that the, the board is a little bit more open um, from what I, I've seen a lot of seasons in the past do. You have some pretty good space for the robot to move around. And then I wanna talk about some of the Cargo Connect missions themselves. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can pull up and get a bigger screen there. Uh, so one of the first missions that I want to talk about is this little blue box here. And these ones are going to be uh, the missions that I think are really good to start off with, especially with a lot of newer teams or uh, first, second, or third year teams. Uh, the first one here is that unused capacity. So that blue box that opens. It's sitting right here, very close to base. Uh, and it's something that's pretty easy to do. There's nothing you have to pick it up out of, anything like that. Teams can easily just push it out of the way and back into the home area to get that. And then you have the orange pieces, the green pieces, and the blue pieces here that the teams have to fit inside the box. We've had uh, missions like this in the past, not recently, but where teams have had to assemble something or bring something back and fix it. Uh, and then put it back out. This is probably gonna be a pretty easy mission for teams to do, and it gives your students uh, not only something to do with the robot, but as well as once that gets back to base, they're trying to configure it and make sure that all of the pieces are fitting correctly into that box before it goes back out for there. And I think that one is probably a, a fairly easy one to do. The next one is accident avoidance. All the way back here, we have this mission model. And this is kind of that end game component. So they're looking at trying to end the game. There's a blue line on the table that the robot has to be across that line at the end of the match. So at the end of the two and a half minutes, it has to be across that line. They get points for knocking over the yellow portion here, uh, but they lose points if they knock over the whole mission model because the mission model is just barely standing up. And if it knocks it completely over flat onto the mat, they're not gonna get points for that. Um, but this is one that is one of those things that you wanna probably try to do this at the end of the mission since that is how it is written within the rule book itself. Um, so those two, I think are definite just easy to do missions, I would say, try to get the kids to, to focus on some of those right there. The platooning trucks uh, are probably gonna be ones that a lot of teams try as well, because hey, they're trucks, they're fun, they're right there uh, close to the, uh, the launch zone uh, for base. 
and the trucks have loops on the front. They have a one-way little switch in the back that allows them to link together. So teams are, uh, it's very easy to try to design something that's going to push that into place and connect them and link them up to the bridge, which is that next mission I wanna kind of go over. A lot of these missions are uh, missions that you don't have to build very fancy attachments for. Like Lori said previously, keep it simple. Uh, you want to focus on, is there something that I can add just a few Lego pieces in order to get these done? So a lot of them, you don't need gigantic contraptions to add to your robot for that. Make sure to keep it simple with the bridge. All you have to do is have something that sticks out to the side, something that's gonna poke that bridge. So those two pieces come down flat and lay down there. Um, you get points for one, you get points for having two of them, uh, extra points, I think, if you get both of them down there. And then the last two that I will quickly kind of talk about is load cargo and cargo connect. So mission 15 and 16 in there. Uh, and the cargo this year is very reminiscent of all of the building blocks that we got for City Shaper. There are multiple, 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 multiple things that you can do with these blocks and you can get points for putting them everywhere. And looking back at the City Shaper season, so many teams underestimated the point values that you could rack up with these blocks uh, for City Shaper. Same thing is gonna be true, I think, for this year with the cargo. Um, not only can you put cargo on the various things like the platooning truck, and that can get pushed out like that. You can put it on the ship uh, that's being loaded in the harbor. You can take that over and put it on the very far side on the train uh, and get points there. But you don't even have to have the robot, you know, go and deliver it onto one of those. Like the platooning truck, you can put that on by hand and base and have it go out. There's also tons of circles that you can actually deliver it to. Um, I think total there's, I want to say like six or seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, six different circles that you can deliver this cargo to. Some are colored. So you have a green circle and a blue circle. If you can get the blue box into the blue circle, extra bonus points, uh, but you don't have to. But then there is a lot of other circles that, you know, even the gray, cargo can get put into, including the circle with the giant chicken in it. So there are six places that, you know, the cargo can actually be delivered and dropped off to. Uh, don't underestimate that because you have one that starts really close to base for the cargo and three of these gray ones that already start at home uh, that you can preload onto your robot before it goes out. Um, and like I said, a lot of people underestimated the buildings uh, for the city shaper and left a lot of unearned points on the table. So think about ways that you can do with your team that's going to be simple and get you a lot of, a lot of points for that. <clears throat> then the innovation project model. Uh, this ties into the innovation project. It's not, it isn't replacing the innovation project. So just want to make that clear. We have had it for the past couple of years. And what it is, uh, you will get two bags like this, bags number 16 in your box, filled with tons of white parts. And they want you to build a representation or something that represents your innovative project or solution for that. It does have to be at least four uh, white Lego or made of, sorry, two white Lego pieces and four uh, Lego pieces long at least uh, for that. And so they do kind of go through and say that that is what that is. Let me share my screen real quick, I'll show you. So in here for mission one, they do identify what those rules are for your innovation model must be. And there is a sample picture of what that innovation model has looked like in the past of a team that has created it. <clears throat> uh, it doesn't have to look exactly one-to-one -one replica for it. Uh, it can look like anything that you're wanting to try to do with that. And, but it must be the team's own creation. So come up with something innovative, fun, that is going to represent your in innovative solution for that. 
and then you're wanting to get that into the cargo connect circle. Uh, like I was talking about circles, you can pair that with dropping off cargo. So you can drop off cargo and your innovation model in one go, combining two missions into one, which I think is wonderful way to kind of look at that is, is there ways that you can combine multiple missions together and earn more points there. And then the innovation project, uh, they have a video this year, which goes into that. I won't play the video for time reason, but you can look it up. It's called Transport the Future and Cargo Connect. It is on the first Lego League uh, YouTube page. And if you just look up uh, first Lego League Cargo Connect innovation project, it will pop up on YouTube right there. It'll be this video. And it kind of follows the story of some kids working through their innovation project of how are they going to help the delivery truck cut down on delivery times. And so they tie, time the delivery truck uh, guy and see how long it takes them to get from the truck to the door and back to, to his truck and start moving on to the next location. And they're just like, it's over 40 seconds. How do we shorten that time? So they build a little Lego robot that says, hey, set package here. It sits at the end of the driveway, almost kind of like an automatic mailbox uh, where he gets out, he sets the robot uh, on there. It says set package here. And then the robot drives away and he gets back in his truck and they say, now we've cut it down to like seven seconds. So they're saying that was our um, kind of our way of going about the innovation project and the path that we chose. So for that, this year's challenge is to improve the way products are transported. And that can be anything that uh, includes how that is transported, shipped, moved, whatever. And in your engineering notebooks, they actually have project spark ideas in session one, two, three, and four. And in there, they talk about efficiency, safety, access, and connections. And each of those has at least four little subsections in there that relate specifically to missions on the board itself. Um, so efficiency uh, for that first section talks about the platooning trucks, the switch engine model, unused capacity, and home delivery. It talks about those particular four missions in there. And then the other three uh, components talk about other specific missions uh, in there. Those are great ideas for where to start your innovation project. And I'll tell you right now, there's probably a ton of companies uh, in the area that do shipping and tracking and everything else. I know that I've already had to deal with a ton of them. Uh, I think that most ironic thing was I had a couple of my robots actually get lost by FedEx. Uh, I know very, very ironic uh, packages getting lost during Cargo Connect season um, for that. So I, I pitched that idea to my kids. It's like, how can we help uh, FedEx solve that problem? And so our packages don't get lost and we get robots a little bit sooner and things don't uh, get here on time. <clears throat> so real life things uh, that could possibly spark an idea for some students to hopefully come up with some great uh, fun things that they can use within their project itself. And so then you're, you're going to be talking to experts, you're going to be doing all sorts of stuff to create that uh, kind of presentation in the end for that for the innovation project. Then the judging rubrics. Uh, last year, they got a facelift uh, for how the judging rubrics looked specifically. Lori, I think, did an excellent job of going through each of those subsections and saying, in your own words, how are you going to see that this is being described uh, with, the, with the students? I think that's a wonderful, fabulous activity for the students to kind of do and go through so they understand um, kind of what they're actually going to be judged on. So they have one for core values, innovation project, and robot design. Now remember, uh, last year, kind of the presentations changed. You're only doing presentations for robot design and your innovation project. Uh, now core values is not its, its own presentation. It's worked into both robot design and innovation project. Um, so it's good to uh, take a look at how you can kind of combine those, the core values into both of those programs uh, and presentations there. And our next two presenters, I think, will focus on those facts and do some uh, 
give you some good tips of how to incorporate core values into robot design and core values into the innovation project as well. But with these, definitely take a look at them. Uh, Lori showed that they have the, the challenge and resource uh, aspect on there. And I think that that is something great to kind of go through and make sure that you check on the updates as well, uh, because the updates will help guide you on the various missions. So the challenge updates, uh, they usually try to update them, I think about once a month, uh, sometimes it's on a weekly basis, depending on how many questions they get asked. But I would say definitely check them out every other week, have one of the students log on to the challenge and resource guide, uh, make sure that they go on there because it's going to help dictate how you do on your rubrics as well. So I know there's a couple of clarifications on the mission models. One of the things that they will probably uh, kind of give more guidance on is for any uh, remote play this year, if that happens. They will talk about how that works with the shared mission model in the very far corner with the kind of package drop from the helicopter. <clears throat> and I know last year it was, if you do it on your single table, it counts as both teams have done it. Uh, so I know that they will give clarifying updates for that if that does come to happen. So definitely take a look at those updates definitely download the judges rubrics, start looking at them now. It's going to help you kind of guide your season. And it gives you a checklist of, are we hitting all of these subjects or is there something that you are not doing? And I will say, as you get further into the season, uh, a great thing to do is those parents that you don't have engaged really right now, uh, get one of them to come in and hand them a rubric and do your presentation for them. That is probably one of the things that helped uh, while I was coaching for several years is you hand them a, a rubric, you hand them a pen and say, I need you to fill this out as we present. Because they don't have any preconceived notions of what that they're, they're supposed to be seen, uh, as well as they usually have not judged an event before. And they're going to give you some pretty honest feedback. Um, and they will also be able to help you with getting the, the kids to where they need to be because they're like, oh, well, I didn't understand any of this section. So you need to, uh, I, I, I don't understand what all that means. <clears throat> but if the kids can explain it to where their parents are understanding it or someone outside of First Lego League can understand it, that is a great way to uh, improve those rubric scores in there. And it's gonna give you high, higher scores on your rubric overall. And then a giant chicken. Um, yes, there is a giant chicken on this year's table. <clears throat> and this is, you know, not, not something that's, that's new. It actually does have a history. And this is something if you're looking for a break in the middle of, of your meeting, the kids need, you know, some fun, some celly. I would say, look up the giant chicken. And this is from flltutorials.com. They have the history of the giant chicken. They also have some access to some other great resources I'll share here in a bit. <clears throat> but the, the chicken's history actually started all the way back in 2011 as a mission model that wasn't used. And then it got used kind of a little bit again and uh, Senior Solutions made some other things in 2013, 15. And then we started seeing it pop up again in 2019, uh, just as a hidden kind of drawing on the map. And then in one of the mission models where it was riding the robot last year, and this year we get a giant chicken. So there's a whole history to it. Yes, the chicken even has its own Facebook page, FLL Chicken has its own Twitter. It's fun, hilarious. The kids will absolutely love it um, for that. So I definitely say, now use that, check that out um, and, and see what they have to offer as well. And then let me see if I can do a new share. Let me stop sharing real quick. And then the final thing I just wanna go over is a couple extra resources that I think might be helpful for this year. Okay, 
So with, hopefully everyone can still see that. Um, with a couple other extra resources, I would say definitely go into uh, First Lego or FLL two tutorials. They have some great stuff under their resources uh, tab, which is great to use. And this is actually created by Droid Robotics, a former uh, world champion First Lego League team. And they have kind of got together with a lot of other top FLL teams from around the world to help give some guides, some guidance, some great starting points for people to kind of look at. So with the resources under worksheets and guides, it actually pops up with a lot of great things from uh, robot design engineering to innovation project, core values, exercises, and more. They even have an additional unofficial guide to the Cargo Connect season. Uh, I think it's a great pair to the team meeting guide as well as the engineering notebooks for this year. They have some remote uh, meeting tips for those of you, anyone meeting remotely. Uh, and then they do have a coach's corner as well on here. The other two are also created by Droid Robotics. I think they're wonderful to use as ev3lessons.com, which has programming lessons, robot designs. Now the robot designs, all of the robots are not gonna be created equal. I think there are some good uh, base robots to start with uh, that also pair well with the initial drive base that does come from Lego Education. So I think the Lego Education drive base through from EV3 is really good. And then there are one or two on here that are great starting base foundations. Uh, I would caution you, like Lori said, don't go out and try to build a very complex robot, you know, copy code and get that put onto your robot. I can tell you right now, Legos are, are still a toy, uh, even though we're competing with them. So though they're not gonna have a one-to-one -one kind of trade-off there. Uh, if you build the same exact robot, put the same exact code in that robot that someone else used on theirs, it's not going to work exactly the same. There's always that fine tuning stuff. Uh, and it's going to take longer to do that than to build and design your, your robot or start from a nice, good base, solid robot and build up your attachments off of that, as well as your programs. And then primelessons.org. This is set up for the new Spike Prime robot. Um, and they have lessons in here, both for the word blocks for the scratch based program and the Python programming. They also have some other good robot designs that are some base robots as well. Uh, and just like that, I would encourage you to stick with the simpler designs, keep it simple. Uh, it's going to save you so much headache later down the season, especially if you're, uh, you know, first first or second year team for that. Uh, by your third year, I would say, encourage teams to go and try to build their own designs based off of the base starter designs that they've learned. Uh, and then Spike Prime robots actually come with a couple good solid base drive robots themselves. So I would start there if you're looking for great robot designs to start using and incorporate with your season. Stop sharing. But now I will open it up to any questions that people may have and happy to answer. Yeah, Brian. Um, uh, and we've got uh, about three minutes before our break here. Um, just a couple questions. We've been able to kind of answer some of them in the chat, but uh, there was a question about does it, can kids push out the platooning trucks with their hands? They cannot. So, one platooning truck is going to start in your home area. The other has a marked space on the mat itself. Uh, the platooning truck can be preloaded with cargo. So if there's anything that's in home or the robot brings back to the home area, kids can manipulate that with their hands. So like the blue box, they bring that back. They can manipulate it with their hands. They can put the pieces in here, but then the robot has to go and deliver that. Same with the platooning truck. Um, even though it starts in home, the robot has to go and deliver that unassisted from any of your technicians or teammates. So they, they can physically take the cargo and put that in there at home, but then the robot has to take it from there and put it into a scoring position which is latching it onto the other platooning truck 
uh, with that one way red little lever latch on there. Great. Yeah, we, uh, often, yeah, we often say that you have to push this out or you have to pick this up, but the U is always uh, defined as the robot. <laughs> so. That's a good clarification. Uh, the um, there were uh, just a few other things I think we were able to get some links to around like where people can see the updates and um, and things like that. I think um, also, Brian, the, some of the I was able to grab a link to the FLLtutorials.com web page. Um, and then I'm sure if there were some other links to resources, uh, Brian, if you get those to me, I'll add that to this kind of uh, FAQ we're going to send out to everybody after today. Absolutely. So. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, and it, as other questions come in, again, we'll add those and get answers to them. Uh, we're going to take about a five minute break um, and come back with uh, preparing the robot design presentation with integrated core.